Hey everyone, Zachary Louie here from Toronto Qigong, Uji Shuen Life Wellness. Today's topic is Qigong versus Reiki. It's been a long time and I want to chew on a real big topic. So um, there could be multiple videos on this. Um, it's a real large comparison, unfortunately, or fortunately. So first things first, I have a lot of videos on Qigong. So if you need a brief overview, you're just getting introduced to Qigong. Um, for this particular video, uh, I'm going to be referencing a lot of historical things, but I'm not going to want to get into the whole slew of Qigong history, Qigong paradigms. There's a lot. So please look up those videos of a brief overview of Taoist Qigong, Buddhist Qigong, Confucian Qigong, and what is Reiki. Those four videos are going to cover specifically a lot of the content for what we're going to be talking about in this video. You may even want to check out also um, Yoga vs. Qigong uh, because uh, it'll make more sense when you get to a Buddhist conversation later on. But really, those I would recommend be the videos you watch. They're about 10 minutes each. They're not really uh, short videos whatsoever because I get into a lot of information. And when you're comparing Reiki versus Qigong, it's a lot of information. So this is where it's a um, do yourself a favor, look at those videos because this video is going to make sense even without those videos, but it'll make much more sense when you watch those videos. So with that, Qigong versus Reiki, what's the differences? Well, the first things I'm going to say is Qigong is an individualized type of practice. It doesn't really need anyone else. Yes, you may need to learn the forms from a master. That's usually a good thing. But historically speaking, you could read a book about Qigong and you could practice it. It'd take you forever to do, but you could. You could also probably mimic animals. You could stand by the stream and dance. So remember, what is Qigong really in a nutshell? It's, um, well, dancing or moving with energy. And it really comes from this shamanic origin in China where shamans would work with spirits and then they may do some energy work. But Taoists would definitely come from an energy work perspective first and then possibly work with spirits. Mainly because, you know, the Taoists were like, yeah, we don't want to talk to spirits. That's not our thing. We like to work on ourselves. We like to have physical immortality, longevity, whatever it is. Um, different goals for different Taoists. Um, very key point. So really from a Taoist perspective, you're primarily working with your body first. You have the goods always. You are the microcosm and macrocosm all at once. So to work with energy is to work with your own psyche. Whereas if you work with spirits, well, they're outside of yourself. Yes, we can get into a whole spirit energy debate of things, but I generally will say Taoists work with energy work first and then spirits second, if that's even a thing they're even considering. Now that said, Chinese culture usually combine both um, at some point. So with that Qigong origin being one step away from shamanism and being more in an energy realm of things, now we get into those conversations of, well, what is energy? All that type of stuff. What is qi? And um, let's just stick it as qi is everything. So you microcosm, you're the macrocosm, you're everything. So what are your goals? Well, from a Taoist perspective, it's physical immortality, which translates to spiritual immortality. <laughs> I am so physically healthy, I could be spiritual. But you can't be spiritual first and then get physical immortality. It's, they usually crosshairs there. A Taoist is very rumber. They may be one step away from shamanism, but they are coming from an earth perspective of, let me see the goods in this life. Let me work with what I have physically right now. And then you have the Confucian school of Qigong, which is very similar. They're very relationship based or emotionally based. The Taoists are more materially based, even though most people would say, well, no, Taoists are very spiritual. Sure but they respect the physical realm and they don't view a difference between the physical realm and the spiritual realm. Neither does a Confucian. So at that point, 
now we move into more of the Buddhist Qigongs, and that's a much later history. This is like Han Dynasty um, type of school of thought. So you've already had Warring States era. You've already had the Qin Dynasty. You've had the Zhou Dynasty before your Warring States era. Like you've had a lot of time pass to codify Chinese thought, and then Buddhism comes as a light runner, saying, "Hey, you know, we have things you guys don't have." Which Chinese people are like, "What?" What, what don't we have? We have, you know, relationships, we have physical stuff, we have ancestors, we have this whole political system and spiritual system around us that celebrates physical life. And the Buddhists say, well, have you considered why bad things happen to you? And did you know there's an afterlife? But it's more sophisticated than what you know. And the Chinese people are like, oh, oh, okay. And that's when Buddhist Qigong kicks in. And that's when you see the chakras kick in into Chinese culture, specifically with Buddhist Qigong. So with that element of understanding now that you primarily have these schools of thought coming from a certain perspective, what are the main summary points of Qigong that we will always say are Qigong? Three Don Tians, representing heaven, man, and earth. Um, three planes, three planes of existence, three cauldrons. There's many names for them, but basically is heaven, man, and earth. Um, material, emotions, spirit. So you have that. And then you have the 12 meridians, which is the 12 rivers in China. And then you also have the eight Ashuri channels, which is similar to the eight energies, right? So that's like the eight trigrams, the Bagua. And then you have all this different numerology happening. But basically, when you think Qigong, you're thinking 12 meridians. You may think eight extraordinary meridians. And you're going to think three Don Tians. This, these three things are going to be what summarizes Qigong. When we move to Reiki now, practically speaking, it is a tantric Buddhist system. So what does that mean? Well, you heard the word Buddhist right off of the bat. So when you think of Buddhism, what happens? Well, you got to talk about the philosophical paradigm of salvation, karma, and from, let's see, you have karma, and then you would also have compassion. So remember, all of this system of Buddhism, it came from India. India was a caste system. That's where the yogas were talking about internal liberation, not external liberation, whereas Chinese culture was all about external uh, liberation in some ways because it was an uh, egalitarian society, whereas India was not. You were born in a caste, you were stuck in a caste, you died in that caste, and then maybe in the next life if you did good enough deeds, you'd be upgraded. The Chinese culture was very metocratic. Um, yes, there was a bureaucracy, but you could move up the ladder if you worked hard enough. Back to that individualism with Qigong. So when we work with Reiki in particular, coming from uh, Indian influence first and foremost, because tantric, um, tantric work is from India, and Buddhism is from India, and then it went through Tibet, then it went to China, so through the Silk Road. So you have to understand that you're talking about one culture's interpretation of the world right off the bat, which is India. Then I went to Tibet, and it had its influences there. Then I went to China, and China literally played around with it because it gave a narrative different than what it had, and it gave some benefits to it, but it never lost what it had previously. So it mixed into that and said, well, you know what? Let's work on sudden enlightenment. Chinese people like the goods. So this whole gradual thing of, mm, you know, I'm stuck here, I'll do my penance, I'll do the mantra work, I'll do the energy work, I'll do the meditation. That's nice. I want the goods now. So that's a tantric thing um, from India too, where you would merge the spiritual world and the physical world together and break the constraints and know that internal and external reality are not separate. That really fueled Chinese Buddhism even further, saying it's sudden enlightenment. I can have enlightenment drinking a cup of tea or taking a walk. And 
That doesn't say you don't do your practices, which is gradual enlightenment, but you have said enlightenment, which says you can get like a thunderbolt right now. Um, how you get there? Well, you gotta prepare the soil. You have to prep everything ahead of time. So with that, you know, the school of thought in Chinese culture was Tian Tai Buddhism, Tian Dai Buddhism in Japan. Enter Usui Sensei with Reiki. Usui Sensei was a Buddhist priest. He was he practiced some Shinto, just culturally speaking. He walked around with various holy mountains, so he was exposed to Shigendo, which was folk Japanese magic, which meant it took from Port Taoism, it took from Japanese shamans, it took martial art techniques. And then you had Usui Sensei also coming from a samurai family knowing esoteric martial arts, or at least physical martial arts, because you can't separate the two out. So then you get Reiki through his whole journey, and that's the creme de la creme. And being a tantric Buddhist system, the fastest way to give people salvation is through a transmission. This is a tantric thing. Break the illusions of the world around you. Relieve karma. Relieve suffering. And then through the lineage, they will take the burden for you, and they will expedite you in particular. So with that, Asui Sensei starts to do transmissions through his enlightenment of going through a similar journey of what Buddha did. And he had the Reiki, and then he wanted to start helping people relieve suffering. And this is why Reiki is a healing system first and foremost, because it has this Buddhist connotation of relieving suffering first by being enlightened within yourself. Be a Buddha so that you can see the Buddha in other people. So with that, What's the differences then, energetically speaking? Well, Reiki is a top-down approach. Reiki, um, Qigong is more of a bottom-up approach. Why? What's the first things we work with it, with Qigong? It doesn't matter what type of Qigong you work. You work on the lower Dantian, and you're pulling Qi up from the earth, and maybe you'll pull down Qi from heaven, but it's this battery effect of, mm, I have a positive, I have a negative, I have a battery, and boom, I'm going to stick them together, and that is all. Um, with Reiki, it's almost purely Soma, or Heaven Chi, coming down and cleansing you, cleansing your spirit, and then rooting in the lower Dantian, or rooting on the earth plane. This is Chukul Rei. So this is a tantric technique where you would bring spirit and consciousness down to earth, so then you can work through your emotions, and that's almost like a revamp in some way, saying consciousness is on earth, now that you have awareness, now that you have um, this spiritual view of things, what are you going to do differently in your life? Because there is no difference between the spiritual world and the physical world. So how do we work with that? And how do you better your life and better other people's lives? That's why physical attunement first. And the attunements are really just... Um, in some ways, whether it's Sui Sensei made them or whether it was one of his disciples, historically it's a mishmash of who's who. But you know, these attunements, um, more or less, or initiations, uh, pre register a person's energy so that they can tap into that frequency and have a limited energy in that point. So if you get a Chukure, that's, you know, um, physical vitality where you just pour that down. And then as you progress further, um, the more and more you can tap into the infinite. Whereas in Qigong, you have to uh, first work on yourself and work on your capacity of energy, but that may not be an infinite grab at first. You as a Qigong master possibly later on, or a Qigong master helping you may be able to uh, do different techniques to grasp the infinite amount of energy around you. But it's not the first thing. So in some ways, if I have to compare systems, Reiki is a much more expedited, concentrated way of doing Qigong. I will say every Reiki master is a Qigong master, but not every Qigong master is a Reiki master. It's not saying that Qigong masters or Qigong as a system is bad or um, worse than Reiki. It's not. Because most Reiki people don't know how to do the technicals as a Qigong person would. They don't have the refinement. So it's like, I could take a hose with Reiki and blast you, but there's no sophistication to that. I don't know why things are working the way they are. I don't even know how to protect myself possibly from Reiki. We assume that the energy flows through you, 
but and that's a protective um, agent because it's a projective type of energy but mm, they may or may not work and this is where qigong is very sophisticated especially with medical qigong of how do you protect yourself how do you move qi around how do you know yin energy or earth energy from yang energy it helps you differentiate whereas reiki not so much so this is why Sui sensei was both a qigong or kiko master and he was a reiki master because the system came from him or at least this lineage of reiki came from him um, being the Sui sensei one so this is where qigong can augment your reiki and reiki can augment your qigong and i think both should be practiced simultaneously and with that they both have their benefits what happens if you had all the technical prowess of qigong and you're doing reiki for people it makes your life a lot easier um, being able to differentiate things and set things up in a certain way so both have their pros and both have their cons you can do qigong for years and you may not get what a reiki master could do or a reiki student could do even at level one but that doesn't necessarily mean a Reiki level one person could do exactly what Qigong person could do. That's had you know, lots of practice. Qigong assumes you build up your own structures internally first or externally, um, depending how you go about it. And you're working on yourself. So you learn how to work on your issues and you build a scaffolding slowly. It's slow, but you'll know how to build it if someone teaches you properly and you'll have that energetic sensitivity you'll be able to differentiate between one thing or another and that's just how it works it build, it's a slow build but it's a solid build and that's assuming you get an education around qigong um, if you're just doing qigong for just doing qigong's sake that has its benefits too however we're always at least my perspective on things is get educated know why you're doing what you're doing and if you're and that will still build up things and once you build things up it's in there assuming you're still doing the qigong every day and then with reiki on the other hand it's you know what a good analogy would be a seed of a vine the reiki master makes a scaffolding in you he makes the he or she makes that energetic scaffolding in you but if you don't practice and you don't give that seed sunlight or water then it doesn't matter what scaffolding I have in the body, energetically speaking, yes, you can tap into that anytime you wish once you get the attunement because, well, the Reiki master gave you a boost up. They literally said, hey, from a tantric Buddha standard, we want you to be enlightened. So boom, here is a silver bullet. You do what you do with it. And... They gave you the potentiation of working with Reiki. But if you don't practice, sure, you can flow all that Reiki through, but it's not growing in your channels like a plant would. You're not reinforcing those energy channels. Yes, you have a set default frequency that you're working with, but it's not that it's growing the energy per se. You just have NP scaffolding at that point. So yes, you have structures, but it doesn't mean you know how to use it. it. Doesn't mean things can grow around it or you're growing those channels even from a Meridian or Dantian perspective. So Reiki does work with chakras. It does work, um, I have to be specific, it does work with chakras from a Buddhist standard, meaning five elements. It does work with Dantians and it does work with Meridians if you go more of a Chinese, Sino perspective, which you can't take Japanese culture out of that. So it generally will always work in that framework, like Buddhist Qigong's would. And if you do Reiki or you get the attunement and then you're practicing every day as you would with Qigong, you're going to get good really fast because it literally crunches years as an expedited system because, again, you have the backing of your master's potentiation. So it makes your life a lot easier because a master already broke through some blocks for you and you have a limited energy source. So it makes your life a hell lot easier on that. Assuming you're doing the practices, you don't do practices, you're not getting the goods. Um, with Qigong, it assumes you have to practice to get the goods. With Reiki, I find people kind of slack off. So um, that's where people get comfortable very quickly. So the most ideal mix I find is Get a good Qigong practice on. 
and maybe get a Reiki attunement, depending where you're coming from. So if you're a Qigong person, maybe this opens the door for you to consider Reiki um, because it does, it'll make your Qigong practice so much easier. If you're a Reiki person, maybe this opens the door for you to actually practice Qigong so you can get those finessing effects. You can work on bettering those techniques. Uh, traditionally, remember, they were never separate in Japan. And they were definitely not separated from Masui Sensei. He was, again, a Kiko master, a Qigong master. He did all the practices that you would generally do. It's just Reiki was the creme de la creme for him in his last points of his life, we'll say like 20 years ago. So he really condensed things in that to make things easier for people really trying to do Qigong, trying to do spiritual practices. Because again, from a Buddhist perspective, less suffering, the better world we live in. So, you know, I know this was a little long, this particular video. I may do some more videos on comparisons of Qigong versus Reiki, but I did want to talk about it because we have so many videos on, well, what's the comparison? Yoga versus Qigong, um, Taoist Qigong, Buddhist Qigong, Confucian Qigong. And now we have the Reiki versus or Qigong versus Reiki video. And this may be just one of the first ones because again, there's just so much to cover in this area. So if you're interested in more information between the Qigong and Reiki side, because I'm going to be doing a lot more Reiki videos since I'm running a Reiki school now, um, a very thorough one at that. Um, that is actually um, beginning two years um, for the full thing. It's actually six years. <laughs> so, with that, I mean, there's going to be a lot more Reiki videos coming up. Um, I'm going to still keep up those Qigong videos. And I know upcoming for the new year, there's going to be much more information around all these things because I've been um, very busy. Um, but I want to get back to these videos and just get that information out there. So, like the information, subscribe, hit the bell below. Check out those other videos. I'll probably be writing some more articles also, but I'll go and link the different articles I have on Reiki and um, in relation to Qigong below in the description box. So with that, I'll see you soon and uh, do share the video if you enjoyed this.